and there's no laughing. <laughs> just moved in with kids. So my daughter's uh, almost four, so she's not at Bridge Street, but that's where we're planning to go. We bought a two-family house, 30-year mortgage, and not going anywhere. And there are so many people in our neighborhood who have children who are five and under who are there to go to Bridge Street School. And I couldn't bring them all tonight because they're putting their kids to bed. So <laughs> I'm here speaking on their behalf and hoping that you'll See, you know, see a way to make sure it stays open for the next 20 years or more, I hope. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi, my name is Barbara Eck. I live on Union Street in Northampton. And, uh, um, just to echo what Sarah just said, we moved there to um, put my three-year-old daughter in a, in a school that I could walk her to. And, um, and it's been quite of a disappointment. But, you know, our, our backyard sort of um, meets the parking lot there, and, and I would, would hate to see it not be the lovely active place that I see every day and the kids that I hear playing. And um, I'd like to see my daughter there someday. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks everybody for speaking. Uh, next is the um, any announcements from the school. Okay. Um, the Senate rec recommended actions: the approval of the minutes of the school committee meeting of October 16th, the budget and property subcommittee meeting of October 14th, and the school committee subcommittee meeting of October 23rd. Is there a second? second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, there's some children who are sitting in the front row here very quietly and they're not laughing. I don't think they're here to present to us. And this is our elementary school reporters from the Jackson Street School. So welcome. They're going to introduce themselves and I did put in one of our reports that we're thanking you for letting us come back. 
to be able to share our news with a viewing audience this time. Yes. Than last time. But I'm going to let Uncle Louise say that whole thing. But okay. we'll begin with our day <laughs> okay. report. Um, hi, I'm Marcus. Um, JFK School Committee Report. The big news at JFK this month is our school-wide read. Everyone in the building, all students and staff, just finished reading The Misfits, which is a book about four middle schoolers who feel like they don't really belong. Sticks and stones may break our bones, but names will break our spirit. This is their slogan. When they decide to run together in the student council elections, they start their own party, the No Name Party, and their platform is to stop name calling at their school. Today's students met in multi-grade groups to discuss their reaction to the, to the book, and tomorrow every group will create a bulletin board that reflects their discussion. The next time you're at JFK, please look for these. Do you, know, do you want to know if the No Name Party triumphs? You'll have to read the book yourself, mm -hmm. or you could ask anyone at JFK. Hi, my name is Kyle with the Lead School News. Website links. The Leeds website continues to grow, and the community is welcome to check out this resource for school and district information about Leeds School. Our generous parent, Anne Marie Maguillo, volunteers to update this PTO website to keep us informed. Our goal is to develop the website to provide information, updates, and forms and flyers as the year progresses. This is a way to also move to reduce the reliance on paper. I'm Ella, and this is community meeting. This morning, Thursday, November 13th, was our fourth community meeting in Leeds Cafeteria. Several families were in attendance. Second graders shared an animated version of the seasonal song, Over the River and Through the Woods. They used bells and dance in their dramatic reprise. First graders sang Albuquerque Turkey with props to engage their appreciative audience. Ms. Malinowski and fifth graders helped helpers offered ideas and came from us and sang another another favorite, Chicken Little Super Fresh. We look forward to seeing you at our next Monday meeting on December. Street School News. First of all, thanks to everyone for letting us come back for another meeting. We appreciate being able to read all of the school news for our TV viewing audience. At Jackson Street, we participate in the National Student Mock Election. This was held a few days before the real election for president. Many students were very informed about the presidential election and had very, very strong opinions about the candidates. We all, we all took it very seriously and voted privately. The results were McCain, 19, Obama, 226, <laughs> McCain, 0, Barr, 1, Nadar, 1, Nadar, 1, and Baldwin, 1. Today we participated in Mix It Up Day at Lunch Nationwide event. This is sponsored by Southern Poverty Law Center's Teaching Tolerance Project. It's simple. Whoever chose to sit next to someone, they don't usually sit next to Miss Agnew gave us a Mix It Up sticker to wear for the rest of the day. 
kids sat next to kids from different grades. For some kids, they never had met before. It's not an easy thing to do, but we think it's a good idea to try. Have you ever tried mixing it up at your workplaces? <laughs> What's our challenge? We'll give you a sticker also. <laughs> My name is Nana, and this is the Bridge Street Team. Besides being very busy learning, the students have been enjoying some special events. The PTO Book Fair was a big success, generating a lot of money for field trips and providing some wonderful books for students and for the classroom library. The Green Team has gotten off to a great start. We have three big goals that we are working on. One, recycling and trash reduction. Two, reducing paper generated by the school office and three, sprucing up the playground. Last Friday was our first no trash day in the cafeteria and it was a big success. All the students cooperated to see how little trash we could have at once. We are also planning to replant the playground trees in the spring. There is a turkey raffle underway to fund our nature's classroom trip in the spring. You can buy a ticket for a dollar to win Thanksgiving turkey or donate it to the food bank. There is also a food drive underway for the survival. Joe Sallis provided a very lively drumming performance and workshop last month. It was very loud for a big hit with the kids. The anti-bullying program starts next week. There will be a film and a four-week discussion series at each grade level and a parent information night. Stay tuned for details. Um, hi, my name is Leah, and I have news from my middle school. Hispanic Heritage Fiesta. Over 150 family members and friends joined us for our third annual Hispanic Heritage Fiesta October 23rd. Parents of our students prepared delicious food for us to sample. Edgar Cantwell, a neighbor and friend of many, provided music for dancing and fun. An artist who creates traditional paper mache masks and has displayed his craft. Young and old enjoy the festivities that recognize the history. Nature's classroom. All our fifth, fifth grade students are enjoying their week at Nature's classroom at Lafayette in the Berkshire this week. Because of the effective fundraising of our parents and generous donations from the Northampton Education Foundation and others in the community, the students are able to participate in this outdoor learning experience with minimal cost to families. We appreciate our bear officer, Allison Ott, going along as a chaperone as he does at many of the at many of the schools. Students from Lee School and Hilltown Charter School are at Beckett this week too. A new nature trail a new nature trail. Thanks to the efforts of Brendan O'Leary and Eagle Scout who attended our school. We now have a newly created nature trail in the woods behind our school. Teachers decided the trail with Ted Wet, our Hitchcock Center educator and Brendan gathered a crew and completed the work for us. The trail offers access for our younger students to a variety of habits and rock structures and allows nature exploration free from the poison ivy that also inhabits our work. The project enhances our Northampton environmental education classes that have been funded through NES. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. administration, some changes around, but we'll get used to them eventually. Uh, but recently, actually, today was the first day, uh, you have five tardies, um, we got notified last week. Uh, we now stay after for an hour, in addition to having to make those tardies. Uh, so things are probably going to change pretty soon up at the high school. Um, but that's really it. Um, 
boys cross country made to the state championship. So congratulations to them. Yeah, yeah we were running this Saturday. Things are running pretty smooth besides that. Okay. Okay, we need a vote to request in census information for the early childhood programs for our life isn't here, but I think we do this every year and we know what to do. So does somebody want to move to request the census information? So moved. For a second. Second by Ms. Pick. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Next is the uh, food service report, and Ms. Morrow is here. I saw her in the back. Good evening. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, last year, we served over 207,000 meals. This was a decrease from the year before, I think partly because the census for the uh, schools increased. We did, however, bring in $14,000 more than we did the year before. Our reimbursements from the government remain pretty much the same as it was the year before. Our expenses decreased by just under $9,000. Part of the decrease was we bought no new equipment and just repaired what we had. Uh, overall, our program is still running in the black. You can see the comparison at the bottom of the page, how in April of 2001, we were $118,000 in the hole and being supplemented by the, uh, the city of Northampton. Now we have a positive balance of 27000 Some of our expenses besides food supplies and labor, our software and our service contract for our point of sale computers runs about $8,500 a year. Our repairs were just over $6,000. And then we have to do things like clean the grease traps and the hood vents, and that was almost $45,000. So uh, a total of $19,000, $4,500, I'm sorry. The total was $19,613. The new scan card system now is in all the schools. Uh, with Ryan Road coming online in October of 07, it's running relatively good. Uh, we still have issues with parents not paying the bills. So if parents could understand that this is like a debit system and they need the money in there for the children to be able to pay for their meals out of it, uh, if there was some system they could set up in their homes so that they know when to replenish it, send in X amount of dollars every week. So um, that has been the only big problem, is having to send out letters for parents who are delinquent. The free and reduced applications are up again this year, and this is partly because it was made mandatory. They went home the first day of school. The teachers uh, checked them off when they came back, and these are used for the basis for uh, busing. Those students that are free and reduced get free busing. Um, we continue to offer the salad bar at the high school this year. We only averaged about 32 meals a day. Um, the start of this school year, we've needed to eliminate the salad bar due to uh, losses. Uh, some of the improvements we made with the wellness policy, we've gone to low-fat, low-calorie frozen products. Ice cream has been eliminated in three of the elementary schools. Only one elementary school now is currently selling it. We do offer water and milk. Uh, for a la carte sales. We've eliminated white bread. We only offer uh, wheat bread. And we continue to offer more whole grain products, pastas, and uh, brown rice instead of white rice. Uh, the free and reduced applications for this year, we ended up with 597 free out of 2708. 149 reduced for a total of 746 students, free or reduced. And that's approximately 28% of the students qualify for either free or reduced. We needed to increase the price of our meals and milk as of September 2008 because of escalating uh, cost of food and supplies. 
Milk alone increased 40% in one year. Um, canned goods went anywhere from a dollar to ten dollars a case. Fresh produce, uh, many items went out of sight. We are finding that from the government, the commodity foods are getting very little meat anymore or, or very little cheese, so that we're needing to buy at market price. Um, any questions or? I do have a question. Mm -hmm. What do you mean water is to be available for purchase? We, we sell bottled water for any of the students that want to buy bottled water. No, but there is other, is there tap water available? There's tap there? water available. Okay. And they're welcome to, uh, there's bubblers, and they're welcome to have that. That's good. But of course, this thing of the bottled water, yeah, our, um, you know, now that we have this new water filtration mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. the water here is wonderful. Complete waste of money. Pitchers and cups would be a nice... Do they not have pitchers and cups? No pictures and cups. Yeah. Well, I think we should have pictures and cups. Okay. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, you uh, you were talking about the uh, ending balances in the mm -hmm. account, mm -hmm. and um, I'm curious. For the last several years, it's actually declined, and I understand why that happens. But I'm curious to know whether you think that. I mean, at, at the rate it's been declining, it looks like you could be in the red at the end of this year if something weren't different. I'm wondering if you think that closing the salad bar will help, will hedge against a good portion of that, and if there's if there are other things that you see that will make a change this year so that you don't end up falling below. With the elimination of the salad bar, we should save quite a bit of money. I think it ended up costing us over forty thousand dollars last year. Yeah. So, and that's almost the difference between last year and this year. Yeah. Okay. So that would make. Mr. Flynn, oh, do you want to answer? I just wanted to add to that. Um, the, you know, we'll be making budget and property aware of this, and, and and the full school committee. There's significant capital needs in the in the kitchens um, that we have been trying to address when the surplus was high. Now that we're in a position where the surplus isn't as high each year, we haven't been able to address that. Um, we have a broken dishwasher right now at Jackson Street School. We had just gone to um, going from using uh, disposable trays to using the trays, using the washer, the dishwasher, and it's now broken. And that's a fourteen to fifteen thousand dollar replacement cost. So we have we have really old equipment. Carol and I actually were spending some time talking about this last week. So we have some really serious needs. Um, in in the uh, cafeterias, and unfortunately, the the as the balance drops, we have less um, to work with. So, with a capital expenditure like that, is it reasonable? I, I think in the past we have asked the food service budget to handle maintenance, ongoing maintenance. But I mean, is it fair to ask for capital improvements to come out of this budget when it? when it's clear that their expenses are rising and not it's so close. I, I think the, the needs of the cafeteria are just going to be added to the list along with the buildings and you know but it does have you know there are parents at Jackson Street that suddenly see us using the disposable trays again and so it's good for us to at least get the word out there. The reason is we have a broken piece of equipment and at the budget and property committee meeting I want to um, bring that forward to see if we if there's something that we want to try to do about that now, or or whether we want to wait. So. And the equipment's almost 30 years old and can no longer get parts for it. Mm -hmm. So it isn't a matter of just being broken, it's the parts aren't there. So I think that's the biggest challenge right now for food service. I think, you know, we're keeping pace with the rise in cost of food, we're keeping pace with labor costs. And cutting the salad bar is certainly going to help us meet our bottom line, but it's the capital needs that are going to drown us, I think, over the, over the next few years. Other questions? So you mentioned the, the problem with the point of sale system is um, parents not knowing where their balance is, and so they're, they're delinquent. Have you, I've seen some schools that have the point of sale system where they give monthly statements out so parents know where they stand. Is that something that's feasible, do you think, um, which may eliminate the problem? Of, waiting until people accrue so much debt and then trying to, to go after it. 
No, we have we have over 2,700 students. You know, today it took me almost all day to put together 100 letters to go out to those parents that owe five dollars or more. Um, it would be a full-time job yeah. in the office. Uh, I try to every two weeks send out letters to those parents, uh, those students, parents whose uh, balance is below five dollars. It's a database. Actually, the principals have been doing some phone calls as well. I know, but it might be worth having Bill Dornbush or somebody look at it. So you can't just automate it. I mean, we've also had um, it suggested to us, and, and to tell you the truth, we haven't had the money or the time to look into the idea of seeing if we can have that kind of information is that available <coughs> online in some way. Yeah. So, you know, that's something that we can look at and work to the future because that would be a lot of easier. It's, it's just basically a database. Has permissions, and then can you do a mail merge out of it to let people know? The other option is that you require them to pay for it with a credit card that's on file and you bill it monthly. We know it's, it's tricky, and there's a credit card fee. You have to do it as a state with a credit card. We, so cities and towns don't use credit cards mostly because of the fee, and you don't let it pass on the fee, at least for taxes. I'm just curious how it is that kids end up with the balance when they go if if their card is their account is out of money they're still allowed to get a meal that day. Is they're that allowed to charge two meals. Two. So when when they're running low and they um, does somebody tell them do you only have this much left to, so they can go home and report that? There's a banner that comes up on the, the screen and my employee tells the student that your account is below three dollars. You need to tell your mom to send or dad to send in money tomorrow. And at 12, 17, they've already forgotten. Yes. Mm -hmm. Some of the schools, we give them a little piece of the paper, but then again, uh, those papers get lost. So they're allowed two meals, and then the third time they're told no? Well, and at the elementary level, you know, when we're talking about young children, I, I have informed the cafeteria staff that we're not going to have children without having a meal. So we give them, we give them a peanut butter sandwich or a cheese sandwich or something. Mm -hmm. And milk. And milk. We're not going to have children without I'm just wondering how it looks. We, we do need a remote coming out of this, yeah. I just have one question. Yeah. Why, why is one school still have ice cream? Like Bridge Street it. School. <laughs> it, it's a frozen product. It, it's low fat. The other schools got rid of it basically because it was uh, slowing up the lines too much with the new scan card system. We need a motion to approve it, to authorize participation in the National School Lunch Program for FY 2009. So moved. Is there a second on that? Second. Is there any discussion? So nobody's been actually participating until this day. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Ms. Hartree is really happy to see that we have bread and water available. <laughs> <laughs> and that's whole wheat bread. Yeah. Yes, whole wheat. It's going to be red and water. All, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I have a question. Yeah. Are we not going to hear what the fees are? Are the fees being put out this year or next year? The other fees is first. I thought you said that you had raised the fees or? Yes, you had voted on it. We've already voted. Yeah, you've already voted on it. I think you voted in August. In August. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Next Thank is uh, Tuesday, we have two school improvement plans tonight. We have uh, Jackson Street and JFK, um, is Jackson Street going first? Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. <laughs> 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 Was Jackson Street going first, Ms. Wilson? Yes. <laughs> I'd like to um, comment that the improvements in the food service around some of the meals and the, having the whole week has really made a difference in our school. The kids have really enjoyed lunches, ask for the whole wheat bread and the buns and the rice and everything. So I really appreciate the efforts that you're making this tomorrow. Um, so here I am again. <laughs> um, here on TV, as the kids would say, they were very happy to be able to come back to share the news on TV. Um, I'm hoping that those who are tuning in will also 
be interested to hear about our plan. I know that you have it in front of you, and you've probably read it now twice. <laughs> Not really, but um, I will just go through and point out some highlights, and then ask that if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask them. Um, I'll go a few pages in. On page three, I wanted to make note that in our school council membership last year, we were missing a teacher to make it um, equal representation, parents and teachers this year. Cindy Nomashkin, our school nurse, has joined us, so we're very happy to welcome her on and also bring her perspective in as part of our council. It's a really important one. We also honor and thank our community members who have been steadfast in their attendance, and it really also makes a big difference to have community members represented at meetings almost every meeting we have. Um, I wanted to just point out on page four, though, that some of the statistics are have changed somewhat in our school profile. They're still um, similar in terms of risk factors as before. What I did want to say was that last line when saying we invite you to visit our school to see it for yourself. We really do mean that and would really welcome you to come visit because I think not only to make this real for you, but also I know that we're facing perhaps an override election and I think that if you could come to our school and any of the schools, you might get a better picture and be able to hopefully promote that initiative more in the community. I know you know our schools, you pay great attention to what we share with you, but I believe that it could be an eye-opener if you spent some time in our schools and to see what uh, level of work goes on with fewer and fewer people. When I was the early childhood coordinator and Claire was the director of the Burn Street site, we organized what we call the Child Watch, where um, we had members of the community, including Peter Cocott and others, elected officials, and the woman who was against the override that time, I can't remember her name, but they, they, we all, we got them all on a bus and we took, Claire was the driver, <laughs> and uh, we took them on a tour of what it's, what it's like for a four-year-old in the day. We started at a daycare center at seven in the morning and we ended our day at six at night when the kids were getting picked up. And um, I know that that made an impact on some people, including the person who had worked hard against the override. Um, I'm not sure she would have changed it vote, but I think she would have felt differently about it. So I, I really would encourage you to come, and any kind of way we can get you there would be great. Um, I'm skipping over all the tables to the page 10, where we talk about the summary of our year's activities. As I was looking over it again, I, I came up with a, a, a big idea that I think we operate on at Jackson Street and probably all the schools in Northampton is that a major goal of ours is to, to, is to establish a connection and a relationship with kids and families. And I know that that translates to success in school and success in life. There's a recent study that I have on the University of Illinois that suggests that um, students have you are much more, the prediction for student success in the workplace is by the um, social skills that they possess versus their test scores. And I know that we operate with that in mind and are thinking about what we're doing to, and to try to narrow the achievement gap and also to ensure school success. Some of the things listed here fall under that category of connection and relationship. Um, and also in terms of showing what students know in a variety of ways, not just test scores. So there we have had a talent show run by a teacher, and that was something that really was something that meant a lot to the kids because they were able to show talents in a way that they aren't able to show in a, a regular everyday <coughs> classroom often. Um, we had a, a collaboration between the city of Northampton and Jackson Street in building our new playground. And that was a model for the kids to see how adults can work together. Um, 
we have had travel nights so that kids understand that, that we value other cultures and other places that kids come from. We have what we call now the strength finders. Uh, this was something that I found out about in talking with the principal on my trip to China last year. She said that they were starting with, they were going to call strength finders. And um, we did it for last year. We're about to begin again. And students are divided up into groups that are cross grade, third, fourth, and fifth graders. And a teacher is assigned to them and they meet once a month and have tea together and talk about things. And um, they are often assigned to teachers that they've had in the past or maybe will have in the future. And they start to identify with that group and they identify with that adult in their, in their lives. And clearly there's a lot of research that suggests that kind of connection will make a difference to them. Um, we're doing the theme assemblies, which um, again, I found out about in my trip to England where once a month there's an assembly after the, the whole school has been working on this a theme. They call them values themes, but they are big ideas too. This month we're working on gratitude and we're going to have an assembly the day before Thanksgiving to talk about gravi gravi <coughs> excuse me, gratitude. Um, our Civil Rights Committee is very active and the, the connection to relationship and connection and families is that our main emphasis and work this year is being done on looking at homework and how homework often separates kids and is not something that allows for success. And we'll be happy to share with you a lot of the research that we've done about how it sets apart families from other families who are more capable of supporting homework. Um, Let's see, where are the other big ideas? The Family Empowerment Project continues, and that is clearly one that we're trying, we believe is really making a difference in our connections with families. Um, our morning meditation continues, and it's very, one of those areas where the kids and the adults have come to rely on it, and is a way to connect with a lot of people and understanding how we can get a handle on our own emotions. Um, our Peacemakers continues, and that also is an opportunity for kids to show that they ha can have talents and interests in other things other than paper pencil work. We have now uh, an annual event of honoring our high school graduates who were Jackson Street alums, and we're looking forward to inviting Mr. Casey this year to it. It's, it'll be our fifth one. I started it when I had a grad fifth graders who I had in my first year graduated from high school. And we're honoring that success, and the students are very tuned into it. In fact, the students who are here tonight asked if Paul had already shared what he loved about Jackson Street. And I said he hasn't been there yet. They look to these big kids as people that they're looking forward to hearing from. Um, I also, another connection this year was when the, um, the presidential election, there were four students who graduated from Jackson Street who sought me out in my office to tell me that it was their first time voting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, it's not, it really it says to me how important it is to make these connections early on. Um, we also have initiative to have fundraising for smart boards, which we now have in place for all of our fifth grades. And that was something that we had seen on our field trip last year to England, myself and four other teachers, and realizing that that was going to be a way to make information more accessible to students and also in a, a channel, as it were, that they would be able to relate to rather than textbooks. Um, let's see, the other thing I wanted to highlight in this, year, this year's activities in the progress review was that we did a survey with families. We are still working on the results of it to try to put it in some form that will be meaningful to everyone. Um, we recognized it was a large job and it turned out to be a really large job because we had about 200 returns and there are only about 250 families. So. Um, we have a lot of information and we really believe it's going to be important information to us in our planning for our school. 
uh, in the action plan for this year, we, under goal number one, continuing professional development and training to facilitate the development of differentiated instruction practices, we're doing two things that I think are important to highlight. We're, we have a writing consultant who is, going, is working with all of our teachers on how to best develop writing skills amongst quite a diverse group of children. And we also have a Mass Cultural Council grant with Bridge Street School that is on integrating the arts with science and social studies and making that kind of content real for kids. Uh, I think that's all I really wanted to highlight. There, there is a lot in this report about what we do and what has been done and what we will continue to do. And um, I did want to also just stress again how important we believe that community and connection and relationship are in terms of making a successful experience for children in our school. Thank you. Questions? Go ahead. I'll just make a comment. I'm, I'm really excited to hear about the smart boards. Um, I have one in my classroom and was able to I mean what a difference it made during that year. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, like access for students and that, that information, but um, even for, for ease and efficiency in the classroom for the teacher to be able to save all of those things that they would normally write on a chalkboard and erase at the end of the day, that they can save that as a file yep. and refer back to it time and time again. It's uh, it's a really powerful tool and um, you know, I'm, you know I'm encouraging maybe the other principals to look into grant funding or any, any kind of monies that we can get a hold of to start getting these into the elementary schools because yeah. it's a powerful tool. It's a very powerful tool. Could, could somebody just explain exactly what they are? That was one of my questions. Well, it's, it's the brand name, actually, Smartboards, for an interactive whiteboard. So if it is a whiteboard, <coughs> then instead of using the pens on, it's connected to a computer. So you can bring up all kinds of things on it, and you can manipulate the image on it. Yeah, essentially, like if you, you picture that screen, we pull that down, we project things on it. Right now, it's just a projector, but the, the active board or interactive whiteboard um, actually has touch points on there, so mm -hmm. it responds. It, it's, it really, you operate your computer from touching the board. So when you click on something on your on the board with your finger, you're actually operating your computer, but you can use uh, digital pens over it. You can pull up video and, and freeze video and, and highlight certain parts, kind of like John Madden does like on the football. But, but really, it's great when you're talking about, like if you're teaching weather and you're, you're looking at the vortex of a tornado, you can freeze frame a video from that and then actually highlight things with, with the pens. The kids can go up and interact with it. And there are a lot of websites that are flash-based where um, they they click on things. And when you put it up on the smart board, it makes, it makes for a whole class lesson where the kids go up and can like pull weather patterns across the board. and. It's a, it's, it's a really neat tool. It's another, I mean, another reason, I guess, to go visit Jackson Street and see them in action is uh, because it, it, you can't really get a sense of it until you see them using it. And when you see kids using it, it it's just so powerful. So. When, we, when we went to, how much does one cost? Um, total package, you need a projector, <coughs> a laptop, and a smartboard. It's about $2,500. Okay. For each one. For the whole thing, yeah. We have we have about three or four here at JFK. And we have several up at the high school as yeah. well. We're we're slowly trying to get them out at at the, at the, at the schools, but they are Smith, Smith Vocational has quite a few things, yeah. but something they haven't done. Well, I've heard that I vaguely knew what it was, but I really wanted to have it described. Yeah, and I think in this country we see it as more for older kids. Yeah. Um, when we went on our field trip to England, England now all the public schools in England have smart boards from nursery through grade twelve. And Holly Gazy, a fifth grade teacher, walked into a fifth grade classroom and they were doing perimeter and area. And the teacher introduced her and he said, and where are you from? And she told him where she was from in the school. So he, he Google earthed Jackson Street, brought up Jackson Street's whole playground and everything on the screen for the kids, asked where her classroom was, then they measured the playing fields and they did a whole perimeter and area of what Jackson Street had as far as playing fields. That you can't do that <laughs> without some kind of tools like that. And again, the engagement that the kids have with it is phenomenal. You know, we're really hard to keep kids engaged just as us interesting adults standing up there in the space, but uh, what they're able to have access to themselves. Other questions for, for, for Thank you very much.
record this thing. I want to start by saying, uh, certainly if you have questions as I go, stop me, um, and uh, certainly welcome questions at the end. I want to say a special thank you to the members of our school council um, for their dedication to the students and faculty of JFK Middle School. Um, it's also important to recognize and thank our entire educational community, our parents and guardians, community members, volunteers, the PTO, the central administration, the school committee, um, as we all kind of partner uh, in the education of our students. Um, sometimes when we're giving our um, report and uh, presenting our school improvement plan, school hasn't started, but I can give you a little update on what's going on too and our progress towards our goals already. Um, we've had a great start to school. Uh, it has just been fabulous. The kids are wonderful and so are the teachers and uh, it's, it's just been terrific. So what I'd like to do with the school improvement plan is just highlight um, from our progress report and then share kind of our continued work towards the goals that we set in what was really a, a two-year plan um, with some measurable uh, objectives. Um, so to start just by sharing up front before we go through all the pages, because I know that you've read it, and um, just a couple of accomplishments. Um, first of all, at the last school committee meeting, I know that um, the hard work of our teachers and students was recognized. Uh, around our uh, tremendous accomplishment of making adequate yearly progress for all students, including all subgroups um, in English language arts for two years in a row. Um, and we've now reached a point of no status um, in English language arts around AYP. So I just wanted to recognize the students. We're so proud of them and the teachers. And, um, you know, thank you for your commitment to the middle school model um, and to the small class size. And I also wanted to acknowledge um, the elementary schools for their hard work that certainly contributes to our success um, on MCAS and student achievement and certainly in creating a culture in the building that we're trying to um, create. So I'd also like to say thank you. I, I know this summer um, Patty McGrath and I came um, and asked for the addition of uh, two special ed teachers uh, to improve instruction for all students in the building and especially uh, for our special ed students. Um, so I'd like to thank the school committee and um, the superintendent and everybody else who supported uh, our goal. Uh, it also, the recommendation came out of our district plan for school intervention team, which is a uh, site-based team that met last year for three full days um, to analyze our MCAS data, analyze our instructional practices, and um, come up with a plan uh, of recommendations and suggestions that was really um, the entire uh, school community has engaged in implementing this plan and all the disciplines were um, represented at these meetings to create this plan. So we have a school-wide effort um, at affecting some change in our MCAS. And certainly our math MCAS um, has also seen some improvement. So I just wanted to say thank you. The special education um, teacher on each team now um, has created a model uh, that will have a huge impact on student achievement. We're already seeing our special ed students um, and all of our students um, definitely making progress. Uh, as a result of this model. Um, our recommendation came because it was a successful practice in our English language arts classes, um, but the math and science classes now um, on each team have a special ed teacher in each of those disciplines um, to support instruction. You know, the content teachers are really the experts in the content and um, with the professional development that we've been doing around differentiating instruction in the standards-based classroom model, that combined all the teachers in the building are invested in that. And having that common language and that common um, practice with the special ed teacher and the regular teacher in the classroom is just making a tremendous difference for everybody. So I just need to, to say thank you. I've gotten so much positive feedback from the teachers and um, from, from parents and guardians and from the students. It, it, it really will um, you know, be a very positive uh, thing for everybody in the building. Uh, a couple other things to highlight right off the bat. Um, we did change our team names. I know that the Jackson Street School reporters reported on that uh, last time. And um, we, did, we, as a community, um, made a move to change our team names. I believe the last time the team names uh, were 
however they came up with them, it was in 1996, and uh, we felt it was time um, to kind of give the students an opportunity to come together as a team community and create a name that reflected uh, kind of what they were all about. We did choose a theme, a green theme, um, at, at the middle school, kind of uh, out of our focus the nation and our um, commitment to sustainable and renewable energy. So we had a green theme, and uh, I'll just kind of uh, repeat again the new names, because they're great, and uh, um, the students were engaged uh, in this activity. The uh, Recyclones, <laughs> the Hybrid Huskies, the Sun Devils, the Green Monsters, the Green Revolution, the Carbon Knights, the Oceans 8, and the North Winds. So those are our new team names. Um, tradition holds fast, and there are many even students and uh, adults in the building who refer to themselves as both right now, but um, it, it was a great process and I think it was an important thing to do. Um, the school-wide read, the young man from Jackson Street, I think his name was Marcus, did a great job of kind of telling you a little bit about the school-wide read, um, but I just really would like to highlight that because it has just been tremendous. Um, we completed the school-wide read, the, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it, the school-wide read was designed to engage all students around a common theme in the building. Uh, the book was chosen by the English department. It was pre-read by teachers, some parents and guardians. Um, and our, our goal was to engage students in a common theme, to build a sense of community, to motivate students um, and adolescent readers. Uh, and it has just far exceeded all of our expectations. For the last two weeks in English classes, for homework and reading classes, the students have been reading the book The Misfits. Um, the topics in the book uh, are name calling, difference, tolerance, understanding, and advocacy. And today the students came together in mixed grade level discussion groups to speak about the topics. They had talking points with the teachers. Um, and it, it was just tremendous. And tomorrow, they're choosing quotes from the book and they're creating bulletin boards um, around the themes from the book. Our student civil rights team has latched onto this and we are participating in National No Name Calling Week and they're doing activities. Um, the, the student civil rights team is leading activities within the building uh, for National uh, No Name Calling Week. So it, it has just been tremendous. The, the kickoff day was everybody had an extended home room and the, everybody sat with their book. Everybody in the building sat with their book. It was read, kind of a read aloud over the loudspeaker, the first uh, chapter. And, you know, it was, it was just amazing. Every single person in the book, at, I mean, in the building at the same time was reading the book. And talking to parents and guardians, talking to students, um, they've just felt, you know, I, I've gotten so much positive feedback. Every day about student kids tell me a little bit more about the misfits. So it, it's just been great. So those are just a few things that I wanted to really highlight real quick. Um, and then to move through the plan uh, just with a few more things. If you look at page seven, I think every year I draw your attention to the page that kind of um, tells a little bit about the middle school model and who we are and how it works and why it's so important for our students. So we include this in our plan every year. Um, I believe that the school-wide commitment and the community commitment to the middle school, to middle level learners and um, having this model uh, in the building, and it is a research-based model, and the strategies for instruction um, certainly supports our students both at their level of development and their academic achievement. And the data that we've been collecting um, is certainly showing us that what we're doing is working around student achievement, our MCAS scores, um, uh, the culture in the building of empowering and engaging students has just created a, a really great place um, to go to school and, and to, to work. Uh, our attendance has improved. Uh, we've certainly seen a decrease in office referrals. And the biggest part of the um, student achievement, I think, is just having the opportunity for teachers to work together to speak about students, but also to connect the, the, the learning for the students. So we're making lots of interdisciplinary connections and having um, the opportunity to have teams in those small learning communities and the opportunity now to have a special ed teacher on each of those teams to take part in the planning and the conversation. So um, we always highlight the middle school model. I think it's an important part of what we do. Um, our progress report, just real quick around um, our goal of maintaining a positive, safe, and secure learning environment. And the thing that's good about this is we really wrote this as a two-year report. So as I go through my progress report, I wanted to go through these things again for you <laughs> in our action plan, I promise. 
Um, but we do now have a JFK civil rights team, we have a general civil rights team, and we have a student civil rights team. Uh, it's, um, it's really, we've engaged in lots of um, really good conversations, and uh, the students team has really taken off. Um, and the students report to the uh, general team. The students have even asked me twice a month now, um, so that certainly is a highlight of something that we've been doing. Uh, the O Ambassadors Club, the Sandbox Group, um, our students are so engaged in um, things that you know are important to them, and they really want to make a difference. And I think O Ambassadors, you know, the students that are involved in that, and the Sandbox Group really speaks to that. Uh, we continue to do our grade 8 community service uh, project every year. The 8th graders have just completed 10 hours of community service. Um, they also just did a showcase, um, showcasing all of the activities that they did in their community service. Um, the community service learning grant that we have last year we did, um, we have a partnership with HEC in the building. We also did an energy, uh, energy conservation product, uh, project with uh, kilowatt meters. That was one of the things that came out of our uh, community service learning grant. We're also working with the Lions Club um, and the Northampton Rehabilitation Center and the Senior Center. So um, we're really making some nice connections there with the students and kind of giving back and, and learning from their community service. Um, let's see. I talked about the uh, district plan for school intervention, um, so I really don't need to um, talk too much more about that. We, um, it, the one thing that stands out for me was it was a group of teachers in the building across disciplines identifying ways that each of the disciplines in the building could support students around achievement in math. The district plan for school intervention was written um, because of our status, um, our AYP status in math, um, also obviously supporting students in their learning, um, but all of the disciplines came together and identified ways that they could help students achieve in math. You know, things like graphing in, in certain areas, um, timelines, all sorts of things that related to the data that we analyzed that showed us where our areas of weakness were. Um, we also continue our, this is the third year of our school-wide professional development around the standards-based instruction. Um, if you come into the building, you'll see in all of the classrooms uh, an activator, which is a do now. The students come in and they immediately engage um, in a lesson um, with an activator. There are agendas posted in all the classrooms. The mastery objective for the lesson is there. And uh, we continue to work on differentiating instruction um, and you know, uh, thinking, uh, high order thinking strategies and questioning and um, just working on instructional strategies that support all learners. This year's professional development, we took it a step further and we looked at looking at student work. Um, so we're really kind of focusing on assessment. We've also looked at two benchmark assessment systems. Um, to do some benchmarking in all of our disciplines, end of common end of unit um, assessments, and being able to measure students' progress throughout the year. So that's, that's something else that we began last year and we're working on this year. Um, our improved MCAS scores, you can see uh, listed for you there, the areas where we met our goals. We set ourselves 5% um, improvement benchmarks over a two year time frame. Many of, and this is not this year's data. This is not from this year. It's from the fall, the 07 data. Um, and we met our goal um, for the aggregate and many of our subgroups, as you can see, starting on page 16, um, you know, uh, moving from, from warning to proficient, moving from proficient to advanced. Um, and we met many of our goals already and we're anticipating um, hopefully meeting more of those. The other thing that we set goals for ourselves were around um, attendance. And we made improvement um, for all of our subgroups and for our aggregate and attendance around our goals of 95% attendance for all students. We spent a lot of time addressing attendance um, and really kind of educating and informing and working together with parents and students uh, around improving attendance. Um, and, it, and I think it's worked. We spent a lot of time really trying to reinforce the importance of being here in order um, to achieve as a student. Um, so you can see all that data. And certainly our office referrals uh, were reduced by 36% in one year. So that was quite an accomplishment. Um, we weren't shooting for 5% on that one. Um, so anyway, we, you know, there's lots of things that we're trying to do to involve the community. Um, and I think our biggest goal at this point is to really share all of the things that we're doing at JFK with the community, um, making those partnerships, but also getting the information out. 
I just completed a four-page newsletter. They'll have that shortly, and it'll really highlight all the things that are happening here. And we appreciate your effort in um, you know, letting people know uh, what wonderful things are happening at JFK. So as I said, the, um, our action plan goals have stayed um, fairly similar to um, last year's, and as have our objectives. Um, I can tell you that we are in the process, one of the teams is piloting a portfolio assessment. Uh, it's going to be fabulous. The students are doing their own goal setting around the portfolios they're putting together um, on this team. We're hoping that this will be a launch for all the teams um, to do portfolio assessment. Uh, one of the pieces of that that I like best is that the students are going to ask adults in the building who aren't their teachers to review and help them put together the portfolio that, and around their goals. So um, I think that's a great initiative for this year. The other thing that stands out to me um, beyond all of the instructional things that are happening in this building are all is the investment and the involvement of the kids. Um, we have so many clubs right now happening in the building. We have so many teachers facilitating um, after school opportunities for, for students. I walked out of the building today and there was 20 kids standing there and they were in the chamber choir. Um, you know, it's just terrific. Uh, it's just amazing. We have two groups of science club kids. We have an outing club. We have a newspaper. Um, the, the activities and the, the kids staying here after school and, and the opportunities that they have are, are just terrific. So I did really want to highlight that as something that I think is really important um, here at JFK that's happening. Um, I think probably, um, to highlight maybe one or two more things, the study skills program is back. We are so excited about that. A group of teachers uh, worked very hard um, over the summer and during the spring. We piloted a, a one um, skill last spring. Uh, it took off and we are now back to a full um, and complete study skills program here. Uh, binders, uh, you know, skill of the month, our skills are organization, listening, note taking, and test taking skills. Um, so that is, is just tremendous. Um, I think probably that will do it. Um, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, I just really wanted to say that, you know, I appreciate all our partnerships within the community um, and certainly everybody's efforts to make sure that, you know, our goal of student achievement is uh, supported and met here. And um, that's about everybody, really. And I do need to give the English department some credit for the misfits because they really organized it and they did a terrific job. So I wanted to put that one on too. So that's JFK. And that is awesome. Um, a couple of comments. I should have said this. I guess when Gwen was here, but it, I, um, it took a little while for it to kind of wash over me. Um, but I think it's. I have known for a long time that we have great staff in our buildings. All of our teachers are wonderful. I, I can't say enough about someone who would dedicate their life to spending it with my kid, <laughs> teaching them the things that I don't or can't teach them. Um, but I'm intrigued by, by what you're doing, you, what you just said about the portfolio thing and how it's going to make connection with a different adult in the building than the children who have already had a connection mm -hmm. with, just as, as Ms. Agnes said that she was doing things where they were making connections with another. And I think that we had a similar kind of uh, program at the high school for the last couple of years where students have been, where there's been an adult that's supposed to be looking for kids who don't seem to have any real connection mm -hmm. with anyone else mm -hmm. in sort. I mean, in today's society, it just seems so imperative that we that we make those kinds of connections. And so I can't thank you and your staff and, and teachers throughout the district enough for looking out for kids and trying to make you know, that one-to-one -one personal connection with people. Yeah, thanks. That's really what they, I, they did. It's amazing. Well, it's, it, it adds to a student's confidence. It gives them one more mm -hmm. uh, perspective, one more mirror with which to, from which to see themselves mm -hmm. a, a different way of Sometimes that's all it takes is just hearing someone else's mm -hmm. view of what your capabilities are to make to convince you that you have them. Um, the other thing, I, the other thing I wanted to say was I wanted to ask you a question that's not specifically related to the plan, but it just was something that hit me, and that is, 
we, we've got all sorts of standards. We've got curriculum. In, in, we've done a wonderful job over the last few years mm -hmm. in putting together curricula that matches the frameworks yes. that helps us with MCAS and it's structured in the right order to so that the kids know mm -hmm. what they need to know when they're being tested mm -hmm. on it and so forth. I'm curious now, particularly in this building, about interdisciplinary stuff. Are the frameworks set up in a way that lends itself mm -hmm. to interdisciplinary stuff, and are those kinds of projects still going on? Yes, we. Um, yeah, we have so many uh, opportunities. There's a uh, work on a child labor unit that you know um, all the teachers on the team are um, a part of, whether it's writing, whether it's social studies, whether it's math, um, you know, making graphs and things like that. Of, the frequency of uh, occurrences in, in different places of child labor. So um, the frameworks, I think our, our teachers are really good at looking at and planning, I'm doing this unit, what's in this subject kind of lends itself to support that. And, and I think we all know that for students, when they can make those connections um, in different places, it really helps them with an understanding. So. I think um, our team meeting every other day when we do some planning within our teams, with the five-person teams now and the four-person teams now, um, they really are conscientious of making sure that those things happen as much as they can. We have our celebration of ancient Greece that the entire seventh grade participates in, and that is something that um, is all four core subject areas, the reading teachers as well, and then our exploratory teachers um, participate in that and make that you know something. So. Um, the, we have our teachers now who are really trying to work with our core academic subject area teachers um, to kind of do cross-curricular activities. But with the celebration of ancient Greece, they're making mosaic tiles in art to display at the celebration of ancient Greece. So um, our family and consumer science person did, um, you know, costumes, period costumes. So yeah, it's I can I can say that you know last year when we were um, doing our professional development days and our teacher professional days. Um, what Leslie just said is absolutely true. The, uh, the, uh, the department chairs and uh, of the various of art and music and PE, I, I had the privilege of sitting with them to talk about how we could do that. And they themselves were already working and talking about, well, we need to know what's going on in the various subject areas so that we can and talk and figure out how we can um, do this particular music lesson so that it, so that it complements what's mm -hmm. happening in the various classes, not only here at the middle school, but also at the elementary level. Well, you and I sat on a subcommittee a few years ago about uh, community service learning, and the, the idea was to, when somebody creates a, um, I don't know, lesson plan or whatever you call it, that mm -hmm. includes a specific project, yeah. we shouldn't just let that evaporate into the ether. It would be so nice if we could have, if we had a curriculum library that kept ideas like mm -hmm. that and the materials that they used and just mm -hmm. like a, our own reference mm -hmm. library for stuff. It would be wonderful if we could also create one for interdisciplinary mm -hmm. um, thematic type units mm -hmm. that, you know, so the teachers don't have to go back and reinvent mm -hmm. it, that they have something, whether mm -hmm. they use it as a whole or whether they use it as an inspiration. Mm -hmm. the, uh, we do have a huge kind of celebration of ancient Greece curriculum guide for all the teachers. So any new teacher comes into the building in seventh grade has that opportunity to see. It. But uh, yeah, it is a great idea. We should probably do it for more when we have an opportunity. Uh, but and I think the other thing that helps with that too is our entire building. Every single teacher in the building has been participating in this ongoing professional development around instructional strategies, and so they've had a chance to talk to each other. They're using a lot of the same instructional you know, methods, so I think that really has given us an opportunity to integrate different disciplines you know, around many different things. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Well, I wanted to um, comment just having kids now in the school, and it's just a, you know, a small perspective, but just um, what's noticeable to me is the passion that um, the teachers that I've met and the guidance. Um, Put out there, and it's genuine, and you know they, they love their subject. They teach it for a reason, and but it's palpable, and it's it's neat to feel your kids sort of around these people who just love what they're doing and want them to learn it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's just um, I don't know, it's just a compliment to, to what I've seen. Thank you, appreciate that. I know the teachers really appreciate that. Yeah. Terrific. 
I'm delighted to see you have a study skills mm -hmm. thing back. I just think it's so key to any time in your life to get on to high school if if you're weak in those areas. And not everybody has picked up. Right. I think this is a really good age to really kind of strong, strongly reinforce that and teach those skills. One of the things that we have been doing are doing vertical meetings with departments um, with the high school. One of the things that we were hearing from the high school teachers was, you know, um, these are the skills in the areas where we could really help the students um, be better prepared for high school. And so we said we need to get this back, and we did. But those department meetings between the middle school and the high school have been really good and helpful in that area. Thank you. It was a really comprehensive report. <laughs> and I think the metrics that you showed were impressive gains this year. So. Thanks very and, much. Um, Thank you. Anything else on this? So we'll go to our next topic, which is the percentage report. Okay. We all have a packet in front of you. Um, we have the first item on the agenda. It's a super uh, the student enrollments. Um, I have uh, given you an update as of November 4th. Uh, numbers are looking very good, both at the elementary and middle and high. Um, at your recommendation, what I did is we did not update the middle and high school. We'll, we'll, uh, updated uh, after the first of the year of the year and there's some significant when we have some uh, up, uh, after the December 1 counts um, the only num the only class that, that looks fairly that is significantly high would be the Leeds fifth uh, fourth grade class otherwise all the other class sizes are, are, are uh, at the elementary level are, are reasonable. And I know that Leslie just walked away, but, um, you know, I think that we have made a commitment, or I have made a commitment, to keep um, class sizes very reasonable um, because of the, uh, the finding that we have um, here at, at uh, JFK of corrective action. Um, and clearly that, that, uh, that uh, has made uh, a difference. Um, you have a personnel report, um, <laughs> and um, the, we have a retirement, Mr. Jeff Coleman, um, who is a teacher here at JFK Middle School, also, um, 33 years with the Northampton Public Schools, He's truly been a, a committed teacher here, um, and certainly will be a, a great loss to the Northampton Public Schools, and I wish him the best of luck. Um, I also would like to um, recognize um, a teacher who passed um, this uh, earlier this fall, um, but I did not have the honor of working with, um, but what it was a teacher by the name of Grace Ryan, who did work within the Northampton Public Schools um, for 21 years, who did um, pass away, um, and she was a math teacher here within the Northampton Public Schools, and I did want to um, recognize her and, and uh, extend the condolences of the Northampton uh, Public Schools and the school community. Um, in your packet, we have the request for three field trips. First one is uh, JFK Middle, two, first two are from JFK Middle School. One is for Montreal, Quebec, May 22nd, or the May 22nd through the 24th, uh, for Miss Jane's French class, and to New York in April for Mr. Deluc's French cl uh, Spanish class, and the third is for uh, a high school class, Mr. Derby's um, high school class, to uh, go to Brattleboro or Vermont for his ropes class in December, early December. You want to take them separately or together? What's your preference? Together. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve these field trip requests? So moved. Second. The only concern I have is on Mr. Blue's trip. He says that the source of funding is parents. So I had to get $100 per student. What happens if the parent doesn't have the money? 
typically they do they do um, provide support. I will follow up. Typically, on they put it on the on the sheet, though. So yeah, you're right. Themselves. You're right. You know, and honestly, um, because I was out for a period of time, I didn't have a chance That's to follow okay. up. But I will make sure. Make sure that no kids will be left behind. So to speak. <laughs> <laughs> this Spanish and Latin. This, this group. The Spanish arts and ancient Roman art. Spanish, but usually all Yep, eighth grade Spanish and eighth grade Latin class. And eighth grade zoology because they're going to resume. Any other concerns, questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 I know that I spoke to you last month about the November 4th Professional Development Day, and I shared with you all this wonderful booklet that um, Heck helped put together. I just wanted to tell you, I was so disappointed that I wasn't able to be there, but um, I can tell you that it was very successful. I heard nothing but wonderful um, uh, positive uh, feedback about it. Um, uh, so a big thank you to Cecilia Buckley from the Hampshire Educational Collaborative who helped us um, help organize this and put it all together for a job well done. Of course, um, uh, Professor Steve Sarishi from New Mass who provided, uh, uh, who helped, and his staff who provided uh, free professional development um, to, to our staff and to those member districts who participated in this professional development. Um, as well, um, and it was a very successful uh, professional development day. No. I just wanted to say that last night at the um, Hampshire Educational Collaborative Joint Meeting with the Steering Committee and Board Members, Nick Young, the Superintendent from Hadley, Hadley, Hadley. said, uh, that he thought that he, that he was very pleased with these offerings and that he thought it had been a great first step and he only had one question for Cecilia about next year and that was what date should we look to schedule it. Right. So that was the... We have a date already. <laughs> but that was, so I mean, yeah. I think it was phenomenally successful, a wonderful collaborative effort started by the individual districts working together and then you know, facilitated through the collaborative, so it did work out very well. Yeah, it was really exciting. It really was. I was really kind of disappointed. But it, it, and I think I had shared with you last month that we're looking at possibly making this happen on a, a larger scale and hiring a, um, a big, you know, name uh, speaker. Um, but one of the best things about this thing and the way it was offered was that it gave the opportunity for a lot of people who normally are not really, it's not that they weren't welcomed in professional development opportunities before, but it, they weren't targeted for them. And this gave such a variety of offerings that low, you know, smaller numbers of people who have don't have as many job like so PE teachers or the art teachers found things that they could participate with other art teachers from other yeah. districts, which made it more more individualized for them and. It, just thank you, thank you. Um, Cooley, I, I wanted to share with you. Um, you may or may not remember. Last year, I had not. I shared with you that we uh, uh, applied for and received a grant that in, that involved Cooley Dickinson, um, and it, it's a three-year grant. Uh, we received the second installment of the of the grant that, uh, recently of $31,773. Um, this year, uh, we used the first installment this year to provide um, uh, uh, services to the, to the district uh, in working with Karen and Craig Jurgensen, our Director of Pupil Services and our Director of Health. Um, we, I, uh, and actually, meeting with the, the principals, um, we decided that the best way to meet the uh, the uh, requirements of the uh, of the initiative, um, we decided to uh, use the funds. Um, the, the the definition of the grant was increasing understanding access to mental health services. So I had to have a men mental health um, uh, background, 
So we provided consulting, clinical services, on-site consultation, intervention, and planning and outreach to, um, to our, our elementary schools and um, through middle school. And it, it, what we did is we um, actually provided a consultant who helped the ele elementary through K-8 uh, uh, parents and families to, to uh, if they needed support with uh, consulting uh, services and mental health services, this consultant actually helped these families uh, locate the mental health services. And that often is um, a very difficult uh, uh, job to do, in particular when a family is in crisis. Um, and uh, if they don't have the proper uh, insurance or do, they don't know how to access insurance. So this consultant ha is actually working with our schools and our, our school counselors and school adjustment counselors and the families to connect up the, um, the agencies and individual students. Um, and Dr. Sharon Salina, the school consultant, actually visits with each district school on a regular basis and meets monthly with with our school psychologists and principals to talk about particular um, needs and, and cases. Um, we also um, initiated a, a social skills support um, and intervention uh, co a consult or consultant uh, around uh, students with autism, which we identified a need at the, at, uh, at the district level. So we've uh, um, actually uh, contracted with an individual consultant to support our schools in that area. We also um, facilitated a six-week program uh, coordinated by Casa Latino for the Latino Parent Group, uh, with the Latino Parent Group, um, around a addressing areas around mental health and special education topics. And um, this will begin, uh, it was completed in April and May, and, it, and it'll again start up in January 2009. Um, we, they worked on a uh, draft of mental health resource guide that will be shared with families and parents. And um, it's been a really very, I think, for the first year of the grant, a very successful year. Um, it, it's provided structure and intensive um, support and approaches um, to, uh, to the families and students and, and, and administrators. Um, it, we've provided parent training. We've provided consultation. Um, and we've tried to not what, what I, when I met with Karen and we talked about this grant, um, you know, 33000 or 30000 seems like a lot of money, but when we're talking a district, um, you know, with a lot of needs, in particular mental health, what, I, what, what we decided was to try to find a, a way that we could reach as many needs as possible, um, but not to spread ourselves too, so, so thinly. And I think we did a, a fine job, and we're going to continue to to utilize these funds um, to, to expand. So um, I just wanted to, to let you know what we've, what we've done and what we'll continue to do, and I'll keep you informed. And lastly, I just I wanted to um, congratulate and let you know, um, I think that Lisa said that you know, she recognized that we had quality staff, um, and you know, I know we, I've always said that. But uh, we absolutely do. I wanted to congratulate our own co uh, coordinator of uh, uh, transportation, Miss jo Mrs. Joy Winnie. Um, Joy passed uh, and the National Association of Pupil Transportation examination, and she is now re she has now received the Director of Transportation certification, and she is the only one with this certification in the state, um, and. Uh, which is quite an honor, and so that you know what that entails, in order to do that, the spe specific certification requirements either requires you to e either have a college degree and or acceptable career profile, minimum five years experience as a director and or supervisor of transportation, attendance at two National Association Pupil Service of uh, Pupil Transportation Annual con Conferences, Certificate of completion indicating 20 hours of contact time from an NAPT approved workshop, a presentation at national or state meetings, uh, or accepted project or published article, completion of an NAPT certification standards including the written exam, which is what she completed, and, and continuous annual membership. And then 
And what does it mean? She, it means that she, um, the professional certification provides personal satisfaction, obviously, for attaining the, the level of achievement within her profession. It means commitment to the requirement of the job and participation in an additional training to exemplify dedication to the best possible job in pupil transportation field. So, you know, she, she decided to, to go um, to Louisiana or New Orleans. Where was it? Out of state to receive this training, Susan. Right? To receive this training, yeah. it was a full week's worth of training. It was in North Carolina. North Carolina, <laughs> right? Um, a full week's worth of this training, and participate in the training and get and and study. She was pretty nervous, and she passed the test. I congratulate her. And that's it. That's great. Give her, her give her our compliments. Yeah. Right? Congratulations. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Wright. Okay, um, you should all have my report already in front of you. Um, if we go to the first page, we have four contracts for approval tonight. The first is uh, to a daycare provider called Circle of Friends, 12500 This is to subsidize child care for working families, and it will be paid for out of the CPC grant. Second contract is with G. Housen for $20,000. This is for water and juices for the cafeteria and this will be paid out of the Food Service Revolving Fund. The third contract is with HEC, $6,983. This is our annual membership fee. This is paid out of the 2000 account. And then the last contract is with Nick Kachoulis, who is a artist in residence, who is paid for out of a Mass Cultural Council grant, and he's an integral part of the Ancient Greece project that is always done here at JFK. Do we have approval of the contract? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful to explore the pitcher and cup solution well for water in the cafeteria in terms yeah. of reducing um, well, what, plastic one, waste. One thing I didn't say when Carol was here is, as you know, the schools are all embarking with green teams and getting right. and working with um, Karen McQuillan, who's the city recycling coordinator. We had a meeting last week with Karen McQuillan and the parent that's spearheading this with Carol DeMauro and myself, because we all recognize that the cafeteria is one of the main places that we can cut consumption. And so Carol is very uh, willing to work with that. One thing that that meeting helped for Karen McQuillan and for the, um, the parent was to talk about the constraints that we're under. Because certain things that we do in the cafeteria that generate trash or waste are done because we don't have the proper equipment or we don't have the right kitchen set up to do what we need to do. So there's a so it was a good meeting because we got to talk about the impediments to making some of the things more green, but then we can also we're you know looking at what green things we can do that aren't going to cost money. Because Carol and I know the bottom line is right now we can't afford to have appropriation dollars supporting food service. So within those constraints we're working. I just have to say, I've been on the school committee for 18 years, and my first year on the school committee, I asked why we had styrofoam tray plates and trays in the cafeteria. It's, it's taken almost 20 years, but we're getting there finally. Right. right. But it's just... Well, and some, some of the school, the kitchens, um, you know, when I've been out to these schools with Carol, some of the kitchens are not set up. Um, for example, at Ryan Road, we have two windows. We serve out of two windows. You can't take in trays through the same window that you're serving out of. So there's there's functional problems to in everything. But you know we're working on it. And Carol is switching from uh, she switched from styrofoam in many places to those um, cardboard kind of right. containers that are more that are compostable. So and we're looking at composting. I know we had it years ago, and we're looking at seeing if we can't get back there. And Karen's offered her assistance to. Um, Look at grants as well. Okay, um, just to give you an update on where. question from Mr. Oh. Case. Um, well, just an alteration. Um, I don't know if uh, this is really taken to the like, food budget or anything, but um, off the top of my head, there's eight vending machines at the high school. So, um, I mean, that's how we get bottled water up there. So, if you just want to take that into consideration as far as you know, going green and all, it might be more of an economic issue, but you know, it is a factor. Right. Yeah, the vending machines actually supply quite a bit of revenue right, towards the food service account. But but do, do kids carry around water bottles that they just fill up? 
Um, yeah, I mean, people carry around algae a bit, but um, I mean, two of the vending machines are like water machines, and one of them is in the cafeteria. So, I mean, I bet you know at least twenty people buy them for each lunch. Maybe. Um, I'd be curious to look at that. If there was an algae bottle, like an NHS algae bottle, you think? There actually are them. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, our class actually is doing a fundraiser. Uh, so if you guys want to support the class 2009, just come. <laughs> um, uh, but they're actually not used that much. I mean, I would say that buying um, one bottle of water a day is a bit more popular than bringing an algae. Um, it might, I mean, it's also probably just con more convenient for people. I mean, it is for me. I mean, I don't buy that much water, but when I do, I, I don't usually make a conscious, conscious decision in the morning to go you know, to school. So. I know one thing we talked about with the principals at snack time is rather than selling snack milk, um, which we were having some issues around, um, just having maybe the PTO or somebody donate bottles so that every kid had a bottle on their desk so that they could go fill up at any time. So um, that's something that we've been talking about as well. Just one more on the water thing. I don't know if I missed it when Carol spoke to Chief. Did you talk much about bottled water, John? No. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. But it, you know, it's um, I mean, it's a great thing to address, and I think we should be more thoughtful as it is a district, because it it gives kids perception that the water in the school is not good if you choose to sell it in a cafeteria, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that, that carries into their life, and they assume bottled water is better, which we know it's not, and sometimes not what it says on the label, and the the um, economics and the ecology and the environmental impact, not just of the plastic, but of how they get that water and the fuel. And I mean, if you really read about it, it's startling how bad it is mm -hmm. on the whole industry. So it would be something I, I mean, that maybe we should think about as a district, how we, how we give our kids water in school, because I think it's a, it's a bad perception that we're putting out. We just, as Davina pointed out, we've spent $28 million to make sure that the water, $26 million, the water is good. It's good. It's good. Right. You can't drink up. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, moving right along. Um, I'm just going to real briefly bring you up to date of where we are with the 2009 budget. If Did you vote on those contracts? No. Oh, um, All in favor? Aye. 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 Somebody taking minutes? No, uh, can someone tell me who's. I think she got that. I think she got that because yeah. we had already gone to down. discussion. I seconded it. She, she left her in discussion. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'll get it. You'll fill it. Okay. We'll fill it. Okay. So if you turn to the Munis uh, printout, um, you can see that our um, original. If you turn to the second page of it, you can see our appropriation from the city this year is twenty three million one eighty seven four seventy nine. That's that original appropriation column. Um, transfers and adjustments. That three forty nine. That's just the um, uh, encumbrances from the prior year. So right now we're working with $23,536,666. We've spent $6 million. We've got $179 still encumbered, and uh, we've got $17 million left. So we're 27.2% 27, 27 expended, which is just about where we were this time last year. So things are going as expected. Um, the next page, two pages over, um, you'll see um, school choice. This is the first time I've showed you school choice this year. Um, so I'll just take a minute to go through. At the top is the prior year, how much we uh, of old school choice money we were using. The first two items, the electricity at the high school and JFK and the school committee uh, dues and memberships, those equal $400,000. And if you remember when we were doing the 09 budget, we used $400,000 of school choice reserves to fund the budget. The other three items were things that were funded in school choice last year that weren't complete when we closed out the fiscal year, so we had to carry those. Those were bills that were um, sitting out there but hadn't yet been complete. So you can see of old money, we are using 447, 47 from the previous year, 400 coming into 09. The second half is the amount of school choice money that we got from the students who came here as school choice students in 08 and we spend it in 09. So as you remember, the money we bring in this fiscal year right now, we're going to be using for the students in 2010. We brought in 
uh, $5,000 we budgeted, 102. Of course, we didn't exactly know the number when we were doing that, but it's not far off. And you can see those are the things that you voted out of school choice. So right now, um, we're planning on using $1.4 million from school choice. We've spent to date $241,000, so we have right now one point two left. Um, if you look at the small print below, um, the balance in school choice on the first day of this fiscal year was $1.6 million. And as you can see, we've planned on using $1.4. So right now, in this fiscal year, we have $155,000 reserve. It's pretty small. Um, this is the smallest it's been since I've been here, and I'm going on almost my fifth, fifth, fifth year. Um, so last year, we had $300,000. I think the year before we had over 400,000. So it's a concern going into next year. Um, the next chart um, just shows you where we are in unemployment. Um, because of some of the layoffs we had, we are spending more in unemployment than we had at this point last year. Um, you can see comparisons to all to many previous fiscal years, but you can see we spent much more in July, spent about the same in August starting to come down. We've spent $34,000 out of the $100,000 that we had budgeted for unemployment. And if the trend continues, it should just continue to taper off. Um, the next page just shows you a summary of all the other special and revolving funds and what we've brought in in revenue thus far and what we've expended so far. So nothing um, on this sheet is alarming at any at, at any point, I think our bus revolving revenues are up a bit um, from the previous time and from this time last year. Um, I'm a little concerned about the athletic revolving fund because it ended the year with only $1,400 in it. So all of these accounts actually started the year with much lower balances than they have in the past because we've just been squeezing these accounts as much as we can. Um, I've added to this uh, typical report that you see throughout the year, the after school revolving fund. We still have, while we are not supporting in our budget an after school program, there are after school programs that we're running through our books that are operating at Leeds. There's the Early Bird, Late Bird, the LEAP program. Ryan Road has a program they call YAP, which is Youth Enrichment Program. And JFK is just starting up their after school program. So while these programs aren't supported with any, any um, district funds, they're being supported by fees paid by parents and by PTOs making donations. And mostly it's our staff working in these programs. So the good thing is it's an opportunity for staff to pick up some extra money, and we're paying it through payroll, so everything is above board. I also added the Smith College donation on here so that you can see where we are in using that. On your revolving funds, a couple of them show negative, as in they've spent more to date than they've collected. Right. Do you expect which, to collect more? No, which one, which one are you looking I'm at? I'm looking on the enrichment revolving funds, and so for instance, Leeds, Early Bird, Lake Bird. Oh, you're on the next. You're, I'm sorry. You jumped ahead. I, I'm sorry. I thought you asked where you were. The, the Bridge Street and Jackson Street ones are not operating. They're not operating this year. And, but what happened was um, several bills came in after the end of the fiscal year that were unbeknownst to me. Um, you know, Josh, our coordinator, left on June 30th. There were a number of bills that came in after, later. Okay. Um, so that's why they show a negative. Um, Leeds, Ella, Leap, and Early Bird, Late Bird. I'm not concerned that one is uh, in the negative and one's in the positive. Leeds, the the people operating the leads understand that early bird, late bird is going to subsidize lead. Okay. Um, so as long as those two funds together net out, um, we're not, we all have an understanding that that's not a problem. So we will be watching this to make sure um, that these don't go into the red, particularly because the school district funds are not supporting this at all. But the uh, deficits in Bridge and Jackson are because we closed if you remember, you had to supplement the after-school program last when we closed it out um, by $11,000 out of school choice. It was a vote that I asked you to take in July because that account was in the red. I would have asked you to take a little bit more, but I didn't know these bills were out there. Um, so one other thing I just want to draw your attention to, I've already told you about the unallocated reserves that we have in school choice. 
You can see that that's reiterated on that page that has all of the special and revolving funds. Uh, I just want to talk further. Can you just tell me what is E-rate? Who am I forgetting? E-rate is funds that we get um, that Bill Dornbush applies for. It's tied into technology and the phone bill and. I really wish I could tell you more. <laughs> it, it, it's allocated based on poverty um, in the district, and uh, there's a other, couple other indicators. You pay it on your phone bill, and then um, it comes back to the to, um, kind of school districts across the country specifically for technology. You have to tell them what you're going to spend it on, and then they reimburse you. Right. For, I think that's right, right? What we get, Bill does a whole bunch of paperwork, and, and then, then we get a lump sum, and then right. we can spend it on technology. Right, but it, it's, it's a... It's a lot of work for, for not as big amount of money as you might think. Yeah. So it's been going on for some years. Oh, yeah. Um, so anyways, I just want to bring your attention to Circuit Breaker. Um, the balance that we had going into 09, which was Circuit Breaker funds that had been left over from previous years, was 470000 Now, in order to balance the 09 budget, if you remember, we... We not only used 400000 from school choice, but we tapped another $60,000 of our reserve in Circuit Breaker. And then to fund the two special ed teachers here at AFK, we, we tapped it another 77000 We also have had um, some contested cases that um, we were keeping a reserve for. That one, It was a higher reserve uh, about a month ago. We think we're going to get by with about one twenty six. So right now, unallocated reserves that we have that are uncommitted in the, in the circuit breaker are $206,000, um, but I will caution you that um, I have had several conversations with Dr. Jurgensen, and I would, I would guess we're going to wipe that out this year. It has been a very, very difficult year on this far as out of district. Um, so we're looking at that. We will not be able to re retain that surplus this year. And also because circuit breaker is one of the things that took a hit with the nine C cuts at the state level, right? So next year we're probably going to see a huge reduction. I don't know. Right now, with the word we've been given is that we will get our 72%. Mm -hmm. What they usually have done is in the last payment, they've given us 75%. They promised us 72, but every year they've had circuit breaker, we've gotten 75. So we've always gotten an extra 10 or $15,000 on top of it. We're not going to see that this year. But right now, I don't think they've backed away from at least, you know, in any way from the 72. That would be tremendously huge for us if we lost that, because I think this year we're anticipating to get over half a million dollars. I don't think they're going to back off on the 72. But okay. I, thought, I thought they had raised the number, though. Didn't they, the threshold, the floor? Or well, they raise, the it every, raise it. they raise it every year, uh, you know, which doesn't help us because then the threshold from which we get reimbursement just keeps going up and up. It was 33, I think it's around 35 now. Yeah. So, so, but I, I, I do anticipate that we will wipe out this 206 this year and we may have to tip, tap into the school choice um, reserve as well. Um, I'm planning to meet with Dr. Jurgensen, but we do have some, a lot of um, move-ins and other issues that have come up. So. Anyways, I just wanted to give you guys kind of the, the yeah, heads up on that. Um, the next page we already looked at, which was just a more detailed version of the after school. <laughs> and uh, I think that's it. Um, the end of the year report for fiscal 08 is almost done. I should finish it tomorrow um, or Tuesday at the latest. And we'll be uploading it after getting the signatures, so I need the mayor's signature, the city auditor's signature, the superintendent's signature, and then in the December meeting I'll bring copies for everybody and we'll kind of walk through so we can see where the school budget that we talked about as being $27 million is really more like $38, $39 million because the end of the year report brings every piece of the budget in. All of the grants, which we don't spend a lot of time here talking about, but it brings in all of the grants and it brings in all of the uh, uh, debt service and health insurance and everything else that's on the city side of the budget that goes into the school budget. So I think it's a good exercise for us to go through um, to look at the end of the year report. It, it gives us, I think, some guidance as we move forward about what, um, how much it really costs to run the schools. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Subcommittee reports, we did accept the minutes at the beginning of the meeting. Are there any reports from any of the subcommittees? Uh, curriculum met with, um, uh, see, Tracy Dawson Green and Ms. Wilson. We went over the uh, the social studies, social studies curriculum one more time. Um, just going over, there was some concern around the eighth grade having only half a year of American history mixed with world. Uh, and, and that presentation was really helpful for us to see that that, that it actually is a justified move to do that, that, that what we're doing is connecting the work that we're doing in, uh, or the work in, or what they're experiencing in world, or in American history to world history, uh, but it also gives them a full year of American history before they take the MCAS in 11th grade, was it? That they, they take the American history um, MCAS portion there. Um, they also shared with us a, a display, kind of going through the progression of, of the topics that they cover. It was really helpful for us to see that, to look at the textbooks that they're using, and it was really comprehensive. So uh, we're, I think, very confident in the curriculum that we're still trying out this year. We'll obviously get feedback. They said they're going to be meeting as a team to talk about what's working and what needs revamping. But uh, they're they're pretty excited about it, and I, I think that came with us, and we're pretty confident. Yeah. Any other reports from any other committees? Budget property in cap in capital taxes. Um, since the last school committee meeting, uh, we have a meeting last um, Thursday. I, it may end up being canceled. Oh, okay. Well, we have one scheduled. Right. Stay tuned. And rules and policy, we're on our rules and policies. Outstanding. <laughs> you know, where this is an anarchy meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that we probably were supposed to bring up the thing that was tabled about uh, Kathy's suggestion about two-year terms for assignment to subcommittees. That she suggested that when we approved our rules and um, procedures at the beginning of the year, and it was delegated to the rules and policy committee, and we tabled it there because we had an entire year before it became important. So we put it off, but we haven't. Yeah, and, and we should probably get to it now, but it, it then occurred to me that for at least the, um, the what do you call them, at-law <laughs> members that are elected, they only have a two-year term, so if we were to say that we were going to do two-year terms, they wouldn't really be able to do a two-year term because they only have one year left on their term on the, so I'm not sure that whatever we would decide now would be able to be effective next year, so maybe we bought ourselves another year. I think, and I That's think, a good point. And I thought we did discuss it in rules of policy and said that we were bringing that here for a discussion. I thought we just said that we were going to, we discussed it briefly and said that we would discuss it again. I think we need like to get the crack, table Cracker Jack research team on that. <laughs> 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 Figure out what you've done so far. Yeah. All I know is I'm going to be on rules of policy yeah. again next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there any other business? <laughs> is it funny business? Business. 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 Yeah. New business? Yes, maybe? new business. Um, Any old well, business. It's not exactly new, but uh, this is the last meeting before the NASC conference on November 19th. And as far as I know, we do not have any school committee uh, going to the to the meeting. So I guess that means it's really not a lot of fun in reviewing the resolutions, giving that person who's not going guidance. <laughs> <laughs> but we thought there was somebody's hand in the air. I just Maybe I think um, <laughs> we have. I don't know about. It seems to me that we have received more than the requisite number of reminders and uh, invitations to attend the MASC conference, which might imply that it's, uh, our registration is lower this year than they had hoped. And I might suggest to them that someplace closer than Hyannis. Like Worcester. Might, might be in order. I, I know people. We've talked about that. You know, just like, yeah. I mean, suggesting be, the, the, because it's easier for somebody to make it a day trip. And, and yeah, I mean, it's I think very important uh, maybe the, maybe they've realized that. I mean, they had it in Worcester for a few years now. They put it back in the cake. Maybe they've realized it. <coughs> they're 
registration is down because of that. But Superintendent, saying it's very important. It, do you want to just speak to that? The, there are several issues that are going to be discussed. The, the readiness part, the readiness schools are going. To, there are several of the uh, governor's I issues are going to be discussed at, the, at this um, conference. The readiness schools, um, the consolidation um, issues, uh, whether the governor has and the commissioner are that actually. Um, are, is actually supporting uh, consolidation of schools. Um, there's a potential of that, there, that come this spring, there, there may in fact be legislation um, put out there that uh, incur requiring, possibly requiring, if not strongly encouraging, smaller, dis smaller districts to consolidate um, uh, if they don't have central office capacity. Um, so we are no longer, you know, in the last time we talked about this, I said that our numbers, our student enrollment would be okay, but now we're looking at central office capacity. We do not have central office capacity. Um, so we would not, we, you know, I would imagine based on what I'm hearing, and I will, I intend on, um, my hope is to be able to get there so that I can listen. Um, I, I missed the officers' meeting last week because of, I wasn't able to go. Um, my hope is to be able to get there so that I can listen to the to what they have to say. Um, there is uh, chatter of, of of other initiatives as well. Um, there, there's there is information that is important. I will be there and I will bring you back. The um, to that point. Uh, there was a quite long, so this is my head report as well. <laughs> there was a quite long and involved discussion last night at the head board meeting regarding the issue of the consolidation and small and rural schools. Um, yeah, well, Nick said basically that their, their definition has now changed to anybody less than 5,000 students which would mean mm -hmm. that 85% of the districts right. in the state of the Commonwealth fall into that category. And, and he said that they did say that they intended to force regionalization right. for any districts that weren't already thinking about it, so it might behoove us to be looking at what the possibilities are. As far as the collaborative, they are looking at alternate proposals that they might present that would help to solve the issues that have been identified, but I'm not sure, based on the fact that, this, that the, uh, who is it, the? J.D. Well, the, uh, not a name, but the title, what is he called, commissioner, um, or whatever. I mean, the, the powers that be seemed first to be focused on numbers of students and cost effectiveness, and they've now moved to this whole concept of capacity, capacity in the district, and their, their point being that smaller districts don't have the ability to have the larger central office staff that's required, that they had a meeting in Boston and nobody showed up because none of the superintendents can get away from their districts to go. So they're, they've interpreted that to mean that everybody's overworked. And the question is, why are we paying so much money to all of these people? So it does, in some ways, come back to money, but it's also, they've disguised it as what they call capacity issue, so. I'm going to be a little bit of devil's advocate, though. Yeah. I think it's important for us all to have this discussion. Um, we, um, we don't have enough central office no. capacity. We don't have a curriculum person. We don't have the things that we need. It's important for us to have a discussion about, um, can we, if we partner with our neighbors, can we more effectively deliver services? Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the question. I think we should be having that yes. discussion. I think that's the, but what we need to do is say, what do we think would work best for right. us? Mm -hmm. Should it be a, a, a voluntary regionalization of some districts in a geographic area that makes sense to us that we think we can provide, within which we can provide transportation for students that will right. involve an hour and a half right. bus ride? Right. Or are there alternate proposals that we can make that increase our capacity while leaving the districts intact the way they are, or is there something else that someone hasn't well, thought of? But we need to be having those discussions before this before it's forced it's on us to, to right. regionalize in that. a way that we don't want. That that's the key because if it's mandated, um, there what my understanding is they're moving quickly and when it becomes what my understanding I will find out more information. Unfortunately, I was out of the loop 
for a couple of weeks. But I, my understanding is how it's shifted is, is that now when it becomes mandated, that they're going to mandate such things as um, they're frowning upon um, unions of schools, meaning school committee unions, where that they're, they're going to want one school committee. So if we combine with one with another district, <coughs> we can't have a school committee in this district and a school committee in another district, that they're going to require a, colla a collapsed school committee. That, um, they that want a regional model, not a superintendent union model. Exactly, not and, a superintendent. And a lot of people have been superintendents and unions will tell you they don't want to go to five school committee meetings right. a month. So there, you know, there's capacity issues. That, exactly, exactly. And, and so that might be difficult for yes. something that I... <laughs> but that might be difficult for school committees, existing right. school just, committees. So, it will so be those are the things that need to be understood. It will be, be difficult understood. for existing school and committees, and it will be difficult for some parents. And, and communities. it will be difficult for communities who feel like they're losing local control. That's right. I'm not from Massachusetts, but I can tell you one of the first things that I heard when I came here and that I've heard it over and over in the 20-some odd years I've been here is that Massachusetts was the home of public education. We know what we're doing. We invented it. We're going to, and local control seems to be a huge component in that. So I think what we need to do is inform our community and then use what local involvement and control that we have to assess what our options are and what we think would work best for us so that we can lobby for our, on our own behalf mm -hmm. to do what it is that we want rather than having well, something forced on us that may not be what we want. Most, many of our neighbors are in regions. There's really only a few districts that are not in regions. So is it useful for us as a, as a city and as a school district to invite our neighbors who are not in regions together Join to meet us. with us to have a conversation about what, what we think is possible, if anything. Is that a useful thing to do? I, I asked the question last night, what, what the next steps should be, but it seems that information is an important thing, and so I believe that HEC is going to be working on some kind of a one or two page, you know, document of facts right. about what's happening. I think that looking at what kinds of models might work to solve the issues is another thing. But I also think that it would be important to inform parents. I think certainly that meeting with districts around us that are not already regionalized makes perfect sense. As a practical matter in Hampshire County, I think there's only four districts. Four cities. I don't know where Belcher Town and South Hadley and all of those okay, are. Okay, so including South Hadley. But if you think the core county here is four districts. East Athens, Hadley, Hadfield, and Anybody else? Because you're in Southampton region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Southampton for Hampshire Regional. Uh, Amherst is Amherst. sort of Amherst. semi, but they're they're, not. they're regionalized both yeah. in elementary and secondary, yeah. just two yeah. different regions. Yeah. Yeah. It's Amherst Pelham from elementary and secondary. Shoesbury and 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 Shoesbury issues going on with them, if, there's, well, if actually, there can be a collaborative answer to actually, something. They're not, Frank, the, Frank the state's County not looking at collaborative, they really, they are, they're, they're looking at regionalization. Yeah. I'm saying we need to be offering them an alternative that might work to well, solve whatever questions they have. I think we have to understand what would work for us, right. including mm -hmm. alternatives. Yeah. Yes. yes. But Franklin County has a grant from the state to look at collaboration, including regionalization, including all the schools in the county working together. So they're looking at some pretty dramatic changes that are not being going down easy. But we're all... Um, there, there are funds available now that to have those conversations, that right. That's right. Well, the, and then the other component, the other thing I think is important is that this is being pushed very quickly, as Alina said, by the commissioner and the, and the board and the department. The, um, but it's also got huge buy-in on the part of the legislature. But it does. And so, it does. you know, while I'm not sure that we're prepared to contact our legislators and say, we don't want you to do this, I think that it might be within our, our realm to contact them and say, this is going very quickly. Could you give us more time to look at doing it ourselves? And because I think that this is going to happen before parents even know it's 
it, it is, but you know, the state is, my understanding is the way it's going to happen is that the state will come out, um, they'll pass the legislature, legislation, next year the state will come out and evaluate the districts um, to determine whether or not uh, districts have the capacity. Um, if they do not have the capacity, they're going, they're going to then require districts to enter into some kind of uh, consolidation and to have that done in the following year. Or at least that's the kind of legislation that they're intending on uh, uh, entering in in the spring. If, we're, if we as a district... Aren't they waiting for the Regents Finance Committee report to come out? Right. I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's going to come out. We have one more meeting in November. Right. Um, we're in the middle of talking about a lot of these issues. I, I don't have the sense, and I, it, it, this is, I, I can't disclose really anything we're discussing, but I don't have the sense we'll that, the it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll that it's, um, it. but that it's that fast, that it's happening that quickly. There's, okay. Because the debate that, that, that's going on with us is when we're still back a ways and really you know, kind of going through a bunch of different And we're being told, just, we're being told differently. You know, I, I, think, I think it's a scary proposition in general, just the, what, what's happening with education in the state. And it's easy for things to kind of trickle out and, and panic kind of ensues. And I, I think what we have is, uh, um, you know, there's a lot going on at the Finance Commission level. And, and really, that recommendation is going to then fuel what the governor files for mm -hmm. legislation. And, and then, um, so I don't know if we're, we're at that stage yet. Okay. Well, and, and as I said, next week, I'm sure I'll hear differently because, right. you know, or, or hear more accurate, I'm hoping, yeah. more accurate. As soon as you get information, I, I think it would be really yeah. important and I do for us to have a, well, I'm not, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a blame thing or an accusation thing. I just think that the information is still coming out, and right. it changes, you know, pretty quickly. So I would say that we need to get information out as quickly as we can. But, I mean, I think the other thing that concerns me is, is what she said, that they will pass the legislation first and then develop the criteria well, on which they're going to evaluate say, districts. You, you, so mentioned we talking, we're going to you mentioned talking to our own legislature. Stan Rosenberg has been a strong proponent of the consolidation in Franklin County. So, um, and they are looking at a budget year next year where there's pretty much no growth in the, on the state level. So, I mean, I think there's, I think the hard thing that the finance commission or anybody's going to have to deal with is the fact that the state is investing less money as a percentage of the total cost, but wants to tell us how to do it. Mm -hmm. So the collision is going to be between the 60% investors, who are the cities and towns, and the 40% going down investors, which is state government. Right. Right? And so they're going to take their 40 or, or less than 40 next year and leverage it and say, if you want <coughs> our money, these are the things you're going to have to do, similar to what the feds do. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the, the debate. right? And, and we're the 60% investors, and we're going to all say, Hey, we want local control. We're the major, majority investor. So that's where we're going to. And I guess I, I prefer that we don't get into that kind of thing, but instead say, what's the best way for us to afford the best education for kids? Forgetting about, you know, shedding all the preconceived notions about models that we have. What works in terms of an administrative structure and a direct delivery classroom structure for kids? And then, I mean, they've and they're looking at a variety of different things from across the country, including county mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just, our, our county thing just, like, went away well, a few years back. Yeah, now but, you, but you know, Franklin County, uh, yes, doesn't have a collaborative, but has a fabulous model of yes, how to deliver uh, regional services mm -hmm. on, the, on the municipal side. Mm -hmm. Right, so there are some good models out there about mm -hmm. how to do some collaborative um, mm -hmm. um, service delivery, we just need to be, we need, I guess all I'm saying, let's go in with an open mind and let's see what works best for for, for us, knowing that, I mean, one thing that, I, I'd love it if we could figure out a way to play better with our neighbors, so instead of having school choice, we're dealing in a better way with, with uh, if we had a larger pl playing field, do kids get some choice intra-district that is not taking money out of anybody's pocket? Other ways to do that, sure. like, that would be great. Sure. You know, sure. I'd much prefer that. Yeah, well, sure. I guess then my request is, we can we ask our legislators to? What he said is reassuring. Yeah. But I heard what she said, which was that this is moving very quickly. So, can is there a way to ask the legislators to slow down just a little bit so that we have time to have the conversations locally? Maybe some of us should try to meet with Peter and Stan and then come back to our next meeting. Well, I mean, we had, we did, we
We used to have a legislative liaison that was authorized to write letters on behalf, but there you go. She's but but I'm not, I, don't, I don't think it's a question of writing letters. I think this is a conversation. Is it, is it useful for budget and property, for instance, to, say, to ask Peter and Stan if they would be willing to meet with the budget and property committee? We're thinking about what we're doing. You know, we're in the middle of a strategic planning process. We need to have this kind of information that we're thinking. Is it worth having trying to have that conversation with our legislators? And I don't think it's a letter. I mean, I think there's a place for letters, but I think this is a conversation. If I was them, I wouldn't commit anything to write. I mean, we need to figure out how to have the conversation. So maybe we need to think about it. Well, the other thing, and not to belabor this discussion, but the other thing we heard was that most of the legislators are avoiding any kind of meetings that, okay. or this is a topic, because they don't want to have to talk okay. about it. And so getting their ears it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. Well, Stan, uh, when's, well, uh, when's Stan's thing? It's not until March. Well, we need some information earlier. Okay, shall we we'll continue to try to get information? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was actually going to ask the question. I was assuming that the Strategic Planning Committee has not discussed this at all. I was wondering what if they are, you know, what they are discussing, how this would impact any of that. When are we actually going to hear from them? Is it next month? Next you know, month. Next month, and they have just the committee's just now broken up into some subgroups to work on some ideas that are out there. But I do think we need to have some information about this for them. And I'm not, I feel like they're in a process, so I don't really want to go into everything that the committee's doing. But they do need to get more information on this issue. What actually is the, are they coming to us with one final proposal? We're still in the process of sorting that out. We don't know that yet. Yeah. Final product is yet to be exact. The delivery the process for the final product. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Is there a second? second? All in favor? Aye. Okay.